Hi everyone, I'm very, very excited to be here with a wonderful scholar of the posthuman, one of the leading voices in different fields, specifically about literature in the posthuman, but also artificial intelligence and ethics. We already had one conversation with Dr. Kevin Lagrandeur about the digital culture in pre-modern times, and now we're going to talk about today, about our relation with technology and about our future re relation with technology. Mm? So how humanity and artificial intelligence can integrate. So it's my great pleasure to introduce all of you to Dr. Kevin Lagrandeur. He is a professor at the New York Institute of Technology here in New York City, where he specializes in technology and culture. He's also a fellow of the Institute for Ethics and Emerging Technology and a co-founder of the New York Posthuman Research Group. He wrote different books. The first one, again, I highly recommend it for everyone interested in literature and uh, technology, is entitled Artificial Slave, published by Routledge in 2013. And then there is another very fascinating book, uh, we are going to talk about it right now, is again in the slide that you can see behind us, is entitled Sur Surviving the Machine Age, Intelligent Technology and the Transformation of Human Work. He has co-edited this book with another very famous philosopher, James Hughes, which we say hi, who, to whom we, we say hi. Uh, the publisher of this book is Palgrave, and this book was published in 2017. So, Kevin, thank you so much for being here with us today. My pleasure. Uh, so, Kevin, um, <coughs> I would really like to talk with you about ethics and artificial intelligence. Uh, first, I would like to uh, focus on a topic that is uh, of great interest today, which is technological unemployment. The fact that a lot of people are losing their jobs, not because of migrants, but because of artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. So what do you think of this uh, actual problem and what are some of the solutions that you uh, see may help in dealing with this kind of issue? Yeah, this is actually a, a big problem. Much, and, and it's a problem that's not in the foreground of people's minds much. Um, here in America, for instance, um, much of the unemployment that we have right now is caused by automation of jobs, uh, especially at the blue collar level. I mean, we already have, as most people know in the audience, um, we have uh, robots that can do most of the work in an automobile factory, but we also have uh, new robots that can lay bricks, and we have robots that can make uh, th uh, houses out of, uh, of giant 3D printers, and um, they can do it pretty much on a program. So, but beyond that, there are jobs in the middle class being taken away. For instance, there are already artificial intelligences um, that can do the jobs of paralegals and some of the jobs that a lawyer does. Um, one of them is, uh, well, I don't want to give names, but the, what they basically can do is uh, the newest ones can read through a contract and make sure the contract uh, abides by the terms that the two parties had discussed. Mm -hmm. So that's normally a lawyer's job. That's a very high level job, it takes a lot of education, and there's already an auto, uh, artificial intelligence that can do that part of the job. So these things are encroaching on um, all of our abilities to do our jobs, but there, there's two sides to that equation. One is it's putting a lot of people out of work, but it's also on the other hand, alleviating people who have jobs from doing tasks uh, that take time they don't want to spend. For instance, going through a contract is fairly routine and probably pretty boring for most lawyers. It takes most lawyers, say, an hour or two to go through one of those contracts. Um, if you have a machine do it, then you can do other higher level tasks that have to do more with general intelligence and dealing with other people. That's something that AI can't do well at all and probably won't be able to do for a long time. So how do we take care of people who are being put out of work? Well, there's a couple ways we can do it. One is political and the other is technological. So I don't want to talk about the political end because that's not what we're talking about today, but just to name some examples, uh, universal basic income has is one big idea for taking care of those put out of work by um, automation. For one thing, how do we pay for it? Well, for one thing, you could institute a robot tax. Every robot that's sold is a corporation is taxed every year for it, as they would be for a human being for income tax. 
Um, and then that money would be put towards paying people who are put out of job by those robots. Um, so, and there are some um, countries that are already experimenting with this. Can you tell us a little more yes. about it? Yeah, uh, Finland has tried it, although they cut their experiment short and they're still crunching the data now. So I'm not confident that that experiment will have worked because they kind of chickened out mm. <laughs> and stopped. Um, that's the biggest one. There are some smaller ones in cities and regions. Mm -hmm. There's one in Oakland, California, a uh, small scale one being done in Stockton, California. We're talking about, you know, maybe 500 to a couple thousand people at a mm -hmm. time. I'm not so sure how to work on a small scale. I think it needs to be a larger scale um, mm -hmm. experiment because, you know, the people who are doing it are, are surrounded by people who are not. So their culture isn't and their society and their economy, economic conditions aren't integrated with the experiment. And also to have everyone on the same page, would you mind explaining a little more for a general audience what is the universal basic income? Right, okay, so I wasn't gonna go into politics, but let me just explain this concept. It's pretty simple, and it actually goes all the way back uh, to the time of the American Revolution. The idea is that the age of 18, the age of adulthood, in the United States anyway, um, every adult would be given a certain amount of money every month guaranteed just for being alive. And the idea is that would level the playing field and allow people to reskill, retrain uh, for high, more highly automated jobs. Um, and it also would allow people the time and wherewithal to start new businesses. So if you're put out of jobs, say as a truck driver, and that's a big problem right now in the United States, truck driving is one of the biggest jobs in terms of the number of people and we're creating self-driving trucks. So it's gonna unemploy all of those truck drivers. Well, okay, say some of them wanna start a business. If they have UBI, they have the money and the time to develop that business. So the other side though that I would like to talk about more. Uh, UBI would be uh, universal, universal basic, basic income. income. Huh? UBI, mm -hmm. universal basic income. Right, sorry. So the other side of, of, of the solution is technological. And this is more radical sounding, but believe it or not, we already have a foothold in this, which is to develop ways that we can co-work with robots and artificial intelligence by, among other things, creating implants that will enhance our abilities to not only do things faster and better, but to integrate with um, machines. So what I can give you two examples of things oh, yeah, that yeah, already exist. Yeah. One example that already exists is called, uh, by Elon Musk, is called Neural Lace. Um, it was developed at Harvard by uh, uh, Charles Lieberman and his team um, only about five years ago. And what it is is basically an implanted Wi-Fi antenna. It's implanted in your brain. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, uh, probably in the future, Lieberman says it could be injected just in your artery uh, from a syringe because it's so small and fine that it's smaller than a human hair, each, each thread it would go up into your brain, unfold, and they've done this already in mice and, and in um, apes. It unfolds harmlessly, uh, no side effects, and once it's there, it can communicate. Uh, you can communicate from outside the brain with an, a machine to the brain. So it's being used right now experimentally for um, what are called uh, um, cranial pacemakers for people who say who have epilepsy. Um, you can have a, already have a machine that is like a pacemaker that stops epileptic seizures. The problem is it's usually wired into your brain with wires coming out of your head. With neural lace, you wouldn't have any external wires at all. There's, the second one is um, a prosthetic memory that has a chip that's, and process that's been developed at USC by um, Ted Berger and his team. <clears throat> and basically, he's figured out how to code memories onto a chip um, that, and your memories are stored uh, short term in the hippocampus and in people with Alzheimer's that pieces of the hippocampus start going bad. Well what they've tried doing with uh, animals is putting the chips in to replace parts of the hippocampus that stop working or that are taken out and they found that they can actually replace memories in the hippocampus by inserting chips into that part of the brain. 
here's the problem ethically. Exactly. Yeah. Let, let me. Yeah. That was. Uh, <laughs> you can. You probably. Yeah. I was just hearing you there. Yeah. Like, what kind of memories are they inserting? Yeah. Which kind of <clears throat> memory? Digital control, false memory. Let's talk about that. Too. Yes. Well, the possibility, of course, is that you could encode something on that chip that's not your memory. Mm -hmm. And actually, Berger proved that with an experiment. He didn't want to do an experiment about uh, sort of something evil. What he was trying to do is show that memories could travel. So he took one, he trained a rat to run a maze. And then he took a rat that had never run the maze, took the, the encoded information, memories on the chip, implanted it in the brain of the rat that had never run the maze. The rat ran the maze perfectly first time. So it, he meant to implant knowledge that was helpful. But think of the possibilities. You could implant a false memory from somebody else that's, that you've never had. You could have implanted in your brain. Or you could make, on the other hand, make a superhuman species by giving them super memories, by giving them all kinds of implanted uh, chips that would give them memory of things that they'd never had to learn. Exactly. For instance, you could become an airline pilot <clears throat> with an implanted chip. You have the memory of how to operate an airplane. I'm, this is kind of an exaggerated example and probably overly simplistic, but, but those are the possibilities theoretically. And, um, we already have the technology. Exactly. So that's very good because we are talking about the now, and now we're going to go into the tomorrow, which is already very much present. So the point is uh, about human enhancement and about, uh, for instance, the possibility of having uh, the development of different species out of the human species. And for instance, Kevin Work, we talk about it, the idea of having different species that are not human anymore, uh, but they are uh, ge genealogically uh, and actually uh, genetically related to the human. Now, what is your take on, let's say, more of a transhuman vision of the future? How do you feel about human enhancement? How do you feel about this possibility? And what about those humans who, for different reasons, maybe religious reasons or ethical reasons, do not want to merge with technology in that way? Yeah, and those are all really good questions. Uh, I think those are things we need to think about ethically now. Mm. I, think it's, I think it's useless to think about regulation and some of very specific regulations ahead of time because we don't know what's going to really happen in the future. But there are some general precepts we can put in place about the humane use of technology, mm. of artificial intelligence especially, and that's already being done around the world in different places by computer scientists and people like you and me um, who are concerned with ethics. Uh, just last year, there was one put in place called the Montreal Declaration, which is signed by a lot of, uh, developed by three big computer scientists, um, one at University of Montreal, one at Amazon, and one at Google. And it's a list of, I think, 16 points stating the general concepts for how we should develop AI and what implants will go with that. Like, there has to be accessibility for everybody or for nobody. You can't have just the rich people having access to the advantage of an implant that's going to make you um, be able to operate better than everybody else. <clears throat> or another precept is uh, that making it accessible, part of that is, is funding it. Um, there's got to be a way to fund these things that, that, that's ethical. For instance, developing stuff for the military first all the time, which is typically what happens because they have all the money, um, isn't really a great way to start developing AI tools for, for humankind mm -hmm. or implants. But uh, so we make, there's a declaration in, in the Montreal Declaration, a uh, point that, that uh, there should be more effort to develop AI for civil use. Mm -hmm. So the Montreal Declaration has been signed by a lot, I signed it just last week. And um, I encourage people to go and take a look at that. Um, Where can people <clears throat> find this, if you can read it tomorrow? Yeah, um, you can just Google Montreal Declaration, and probably, if you can't, doesn't come up, just put AI at the end of it. You can the website, and then you can uh, sign through the website. Yes. You can click through, take a look at it, take a look at the concepts that have been set up, and sign it. And then our, it's also an ongoing development, so you, you, once you sign up, you also, uh, there are avenues through which you can get involved in actually helping develop these concepts uh, for ethical development of AI. So, so to go back to work just for a second, <clears throat> the idea is that these implants 
could enable us, say, neural lace, we could have, if I had a Wi-Fi antenna embedded in my head, and it was as easy, easy to put in and cheap as just injecting uh, a fine mesh into my carotid mm -hmm. artery and waiting, you know, a couple weeks, I could then instantly communicate with any machine on the floor of a factory. I could, somebody like me, if I had it, I could run a whole factory of machines. That's a, that would create a whole new job category and it wouldn't necessarily take a huge amount of retraining or reskilling because you could take somebody who already understands the factory floor, gets the implant, they would have a pretty short time horizon to learn what they needed to learn to have a bigger, better, and maybe more uh, higher, higher paying job. All right, and on yeah. this uh, uh, tone, I have one more question and then we're going to wrap it up. Uh, I see something that is developing more and more around myself, which is something that I like to call technological addiction. I see people that <laughs> cannot stop being connected to the internet, being on social medias. Now, once you have your chip inside of your body, there is absolutely no way you can disconnect. How do you feel about uh, merging with technology, the problem with technological addiction and the problem of technological control, uh, privacy? So how do you feel about those topics? Yeah, I worry about that. And my, I talk about these things with my students. And the first thing they say when I talk about neural lace, they say, well, doesn't that mean somebody could hack your brain mm. through the internet? Mm. Well, theoretically, I suppose, but you have to also, <laughs> you'd have to also develop, in addition to the mesh, things attached to the mesh inside your head that could translate various types of computer language into something you'd understand. Well, I had this experience with uh, the Iborg. He is, um, let's say, the first human being who can actually uh, hear colors. Um, and he has actually has an antenna connected to his brain. Right, I've, I've seen him. Exactly, yeah. in order to hear color because he was born uh, colorblind, so he cannot see colors, but he can hear them now. And I actually asked this question, we were on a panel, and I asked him, did you ever, got, did you ever get hacked? And he said yes. And he was at a conference, and all of a sudden he was speaking, and all of a sudden he felt he should say something that it was not his ideas, and later on he realized that he actually been hacked. And he was neutral about it, said, yeah, it happened, it's fine. But I think that <laughs> we can little, uh, you know, like develop a little more that experience. I mean, it's a possibility. And it's something that, apart from being hacked once, the idea is that, like, uh, especially nowadays with digital control, uh, the fact that uh, big corporations could have access to uh, our own inner knowledge, mm -hmm. I'm not sure about I feel about that. You know, these, so, are, these are all sort of no. really highly theoretical yeah. possibilities. But if you have something implanted in your brain that um, is already reactive to a machine that, say, uh, is like a pacemaker that sends pulses into your brain, that's already a way to hack the brain, and that exists now. So, yeah, so I think we need to, and of course, this extends to all of society's machines, we need to be more careful about developing um, curbs for these machines. Mm -hmm. We already, you can already be hacked, your whole house can be hacked, by way of a back door built into uh, a digital thermostat. I mean, that, that's not being taken care of carefully enough already. So yes, with all of these things in the future, we need to be very careful about building in fail safes. So is this an exciting future? I think it's an exciting future uh, if we are judicious about how we use our technology. It's a perfect way to end our second conversation. So first of all, I would like to thank Kevin Lagrander so much for being here with us today, bringing us so many interesting notions and ideas to really think about uh, the universal basic income, technological unemployment, the merging of technology and the human in, in this second conversation. We also have a first conversation in which we talked about digital culture in pre-modern times. Uh, again, Kevin Lagrander is a leading voice in the post-human field. Uh, he's uh, present in many conferences and he's also the co-founder of the New York post -Human Research Group. Uh, so if you want to meet him, come to our, one of our uh, events or, uh, or connect with him online. He has uh, social medias. Yes, um, uh, you can find me very easily by Googling my name. Perfect. So thank you so much, Kevin, for being here. My and pleasure. thanks so much for all of us who are really trying to uh, develop the future in ways that are desirable and not just in ways that we feel that that's the only way it's going to be. No, it's not the only way it's going to be. There are so many possible ways. We are shaping the future, we are imagining the future, and we are envisioning the future. Thank you so much, Kevin, for being a visionary. And thanks all of you.